Welcome to Bully Ball presented by DraftKings. I am Rachel Nichols. That, as always, is Mr. DeMarcus Cousins, still in Taiwan. And you can tell because he has no plant, and that makes me very sad. Fortunately, we have Rajan Rondo with us again, who is a beautiful... You're giving us a beautiful tour of your house, basically. Every episode, we get a different view. It's a nice crib, man. I'm, I'm impressed, is all I got to say. Appreciate it. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> but you got to step it up over there. Yeah, I'm trying, man. I'm trying. <laughs> I think they'll owe me a little money anyway, but we'll talk about that another time. Oh, my last right. what, what'd you say? I think you owe me a little bread for my last Blu ray game, but I could be wrong. I'm going to check my notes, though. <laughs> it's been 12 years since I was your teammate. <laughs> man, don't matter. <laughs> dead is dead. I was going to say, man, I mean, you got to pay your debts. You, you owe me. I've never been in your book. Stop. <laughs> That's not true. Man, what? You, I think I got a little section of the house over here with your name on it, actually. That's oh, cool. We, oh, hey, okay. we can settle with that then. I'm cool. But you with donated. That, my plan, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the rooms are so nice, Bug. <laughs> tell you, them years I was with Cuz, it was like, you my oh, dog, man. You God. sweet as a. Nah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and now one of you is in a palatial estate and the other one has a giant door behind him. You know, whatever, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> Here you go. That door from, uh, that's a special wood though, so don't get it twisted. That's, all right, all right, yeah. all right. I'm going to let fancy you know door. where it was shipped from, yeah. It might have a dorm room, that's what it looked like. Uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I was going to make this an interior decorating podcast, but instead, let's talk about some NBA. <laughs> Guys, we got to talk the best series of this round, Denver, Minnesota, after dropping the two first games at home, a lot of people just burying them after those couple games. The Nuggets came back, even the series. This was a crazy weekend in Minnesota. And, and look, I don't know what's going to happen here, and Denver is not out of the woods. Only five teams in the history of the NBA – have ever gone down 0-2 at home and then come back to win a best of seven. So the mountain is very steep still for them. Minnesota, obviously, exceptional. And Edwards, again, another 40-point-plus game. So they are still super dangerous. But it does feel like the Nuggets took something back in this series, that they figured something else out. Jamal Murray, I, they had a few days break. The, every series has a little bit of a break at some point, and this was where the Minnesota Denver one was right before they went into Minnesota. So I think Jamal Murray looked healthier, just looked better. Um, and, and obviously Aaron Gordon made a huge impact on, on both of these games, but particularly in game four, I thought Michael Malone had some great strategy there, took Aaron Gordon a bit out of the dunker spot, made Gobert run around a bit more on the perim perimeter. But overall to the feel of this team, Boogie, it just felt like a team that knew what it had to do in those big moments. And Minnesota, man, just got overwhelmed a few times, right? Absolutely. Um, I think we're seeing the difference between a championship veteran team and a young team that's trying to figure it out. Um, obviously, uh, Minnesota found some success early on in the series. Um, I'm not going to take away the fact that I think they're a great team, uh, which I, I still think they are. But on the flip side of things, when it comes to Denver, they show they've shown that they have another level that they can go to. And, um, you know, that's what we've seen in the last two games from this series. So uh, with that being said, um, obviously, Coach Malone has made some adjustments, like you said, when it comes to Aaron Gordon, moving them around the floor. Um, I don't I don't like to <laughs> to be the dead horse, but when it comes to um, a three-time defensive player of the year. I, I, I know you're going with that. I'm going to need a little more. <laughs> I'm going to need a little more on the defensive end. A and, whole um, lot more. Four times, and, four times, even, by the way. Oh, four, oh excuse me. Right. Excuse me. I, yeah. Four-time defensive player of the year. Um, You look at the defensive numbers, it's, it's you know, it's 1.3 blocks a game. And then I looked at the other side, and I look at Nikola Jokic, who's a guy who isn't even considered defensive – a defensive player, but he's averaging about 1.8 blocks a game, almost two steals a game. So I'm just not really understanding the narrative or the impact that everybody is seeing from this so-called, you know, generational defender. Um, so obviously I feel like it needs to be, it, it needs to be more from that, 
from that end on the on the Minnesota side. But um, at the end of the day, this is a you know the reigning champs. They've been here before. They've seen they they're a well seasoned team. They've been through a lot of adversity. They've been on the losing side of things. They've been on the winning side of things. So they've they've seen it all when it comes to being at this stage. And um, we're now seeing a young team that's figuring it out, and they're now starting to hit their adversity. So, uh, or or you could say growing pain. So um, I think that's the difference in the series. Obviously, Jamal Murray stepping up and 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 playing at the level that we're accustomed to seeing at this time of year from him that helps Denver tremendously. Uh, Aaron Gordon stepping up, playing the way he played in the last game, and um, you know that's the results of those guys stepping up and on the other side of things, you're going to need more than just Anthony Edwards scoring 40 points in the game. He's going to need more production from the guys around him. Cat didn't have the greatest shooting night. Um, we're going to need more production from him. We, we, in order for them to find success in this series, Cat's going to have to average at least 18 to 22 a game per night. So um, it's definitely going to need, on the Minnesota Minnesota side of things, they're definitely gonna have to step up from a production standpoint. Obviously, Cat offensively, the generational defender definitely has to step up. And um, <laughs> you know, that's so you gotta I'm jump cool. in and go bear. Come on. Man, I mean, I, I, just, I, was just, I don't I was understand. Waiting to see, he still I don't understand. <laughs> I, I don't see it. I don't see it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, and this is no hate. This is no knock. Like, I'm a fan of this game. I. I've played against Ben Wallace. I've played against like generational defenders. Like I've played against uh, Ron Artest, uh, guys that that are known for defense. And it's just it don't hit the same. It just doesn't. Um, and, and I and I don't understand this narrative because it's it's got to be a narrative at this point. It's not a factual thing. It's ha- it has to be a narrative. I don't see it. <sighs> <sighs> give me your thoughts though (laughs) you hit it on the head but i'm not gonna put it all on rudy um i think it's a hell of a coaching adjustment from malone uh you know i love seeing coaches make these type of adjustments during these type of series uh down oh two but again defend the champs you can never count out the champs you know the heart of a champion uh what a a champion has been through as far as adversity um actually being down in series being able to stick together figure out, find a solution to, to these problems. Uh, starts with Jamal Murray. You know, I think he's kind of figured it out. He's a, he's a uh, tough shot maker, man. I mean, he had a hell of a couple of shots yesterday. Dude, oh. that shot, that shot that he hit right before <laughs> halftime. Oh my goodness. No, not the, yeah, not the bus. I'm talking about the, the one McDaniels played great defense. He was like two yeah. seconds on the shot clock. I mean, this is, he's a fun player to watch. You know, he's electrifying. Um, I'm sure he puts hours and hours in on his craft. And, again, he struggled, you know, his first two games. But then he figured it out. I don't know if it was help or not. I just feel like it was an adjustment getting used to guys that really actually take pride in defense and want it every possession. So, um, mm-hmm. not saying he has completely figured it out, again, because we have three games left. But uh, he's, he's in a great rhythm, I'm sure. And he's going he's feeling good going back to Denver. I want to see what, Finn, what Coach Finn does. Um, you know, he's a great coach. I had him in New Orleans, uh, offensive mindset. Uh, so I'm going to see what he's going to do adjustment-wise. Uh, Carlton Towns can't shoot five for 18 from the field. Um, Goldberg can't just give you 11 points. So I think you have to insert more Nas Reed. You know, he didn't play a lot last uh, last game, last couple, I believe. Uh, and that's been, been Cubs guys from day one. Um, so kudos to Cubs for seeing that a long time ago. But, again, he has to play. Because, again, who else is going to score the basketball? You know, Mike Conley gave him a, a solid lift as far as the starting PG. You know, Edwards hit 40. But after that, you know, they're running McDaniels off the line, um, you know, waiting on the young fella off the bench, Alexander, to get back to a good rhythm. You know, they need a spark from him as well. So uh, it's going to take a team effort. You know, Anthony Edwards did apologize for game three. But, <clears throat> uh, but you know, like I said, he came out game four, did what he had to do, but it wasn't enough as far as the team impact. Uh, and back to what Coach, uh, what Cuz is saying about Rudy. Um, his, he doesn't have a defensive presence out there. Uh, he's not able to do what Nas Reed does as far as picking Joker up. Um causing, you know, turnovers. Like I said, he hasn't, he's, he looks really comfortable. Uh, Joker's, you know, biting the shit out of him, uh, shooting floaters, shots. I mean, he's getting everything he wants and still being a, a great facilitator and a quarterback on the court. So, uh, he's not causing any disruptive on, on either side of the ball. Um, and then also they made, and like I said, Malone did a hell of a job by corralling Anthony Edwards at the top, making him throw the pocket pass, making, uh, Rudy Gobert turn into Draymond Green. 
which we saw mm-hmm. yesterday at five turnovers. So um, that's going to be tough. Now, if you give now Reed that ball right there, I mean, he's a hell of a he's a way better playmaker than Gobert. So for me, it's not just offensively not being able to block shots or change things. It's also offensively as well, because because again, if he's having to be the playmaker when they're when they're setting picks with him, th- they're living with that. You know yep. what I mean? Like he's he's not aggressive enough. He can't get to the rim, and if you you know he's not shooting over eighty, I think, or eighty five from the free throw line. So it's kind of a lose lose for them to put the ball in his hands in the middle of the court. And that's where again, I, you know, kudos to Coach Malone. I mean, this is the problem with Defensive Player of the Year being a regular season award. Because if you look at the regular season numbers, I agree with you because they're not there in the playoffs because the level of competition rises and different things get exposed. But it is a regular season award. And when you yeah, have to they, play they, every team not, in the league. Well, go, go, tell me. No, I'm saying they're not better than Wimby. I mean, his his numbers aren't, you know, better than the rookie of the year. So it's like, you well, say regular they, season numbers, but it's like he has a better team defensive mindset. Yeah. Like, you know, you got them, them dogs on the wings. You got a, a leader in the pack like Anthony Edwards, like, yeah, your team is going to be a better defensive team, but it's an individual award, so I don't get it. No, you're right. And I mean, look, not, for me with Wemby, it was not, a little bit of like – Go ahead. well, I was going to say, for me with Wemby, it was a little bit of – it took him a, a, a couple months to get his feet under him defensively uh-huh. in the league, and I just sort of felt like, great. I think from here on out, frankly, I mean, I can almost fill it out now that I'll be voting for Wemby for the next <laughs> however many years for Defensive right. Player of the Year, but let, like – the beginning of the season counts too. So that's kind of where I was on, on that. But I do feel a little bit as a voter, it's always hard because you can only vote on what they put in front of you and you're voting on the regular season and that's what you have to do. And yet I know what happens in the playoffs. It's not like I'm not watching every season, right? right. So it's it's just, it's a hard thing. And I get it. I get the frustration from other players because when a guy is tested, you're not seeing it from Rudy Gobert in the postseason. I get it. We and never look, seen it. Anthony, ever, ever, ever. <laughs> Right, <laughs> not once, and that's what where it's just like I don't. Pe- and it's like and it would be, and it would be, like, it's crazy. Yeah, it, it would be more understandable if it was. You know, maybe he got one. You know, defensive player. We're yeah. talking. No, four. I get it. Yep, four. So yep. that puts him in a category of the elite of the elite. And when I no Ben Wallace and Hakeem, and by the way, he's not Ben Wallace, and he is not Hakeem, and we all know it. Even the people voting, it's not even close. So for me, like I said, it's now becoming a narrative, and it's not really factual. Like, yeah, we keep awarding this guy for regular season, and and though me and you can speak on this, when it comes to regular season, most of the time the good teams are going through the motions. You just go through the motions. You do the same thing every night, which produces the wins. Cool. Playoff come, you have to become a player. Everybody knows mm-hmm. that. And I have yet mm-hmm. to see it. I haven't seen it. So why do we mm-hmm. keep awarding this guy for a bullshit ass regular season? I don't I don't understand it. I just feel I, I, it has to for me it's a team award because I say this, mm-hmm. Kevin won defensive player of the year. But Kevin, it was me, Perk, Tony Allen, Posey on the floor. Yep. Like, I mean, Kevin was our anchor. No doubt about it. He deserved it. Well, I'm not saying that, but again. Having a team around you that that prides itself on defense, your numbers look better. Like I, I get right. it, that's going to yeah. happen. But if you're on a no, team and they where they were the number one defense this season, <laughs> that's my and point. that matters that's too. So oh, Jalen McDaniels doesn't get considered. He's one of the best wing defenders in the league. He didn't even get considered. Uh, Anthony Edwards, like he's a right. dog on the defensive end. Alexander, Mike Conley Michael has Conley, always Benjamin. been great defensive. Right. So I'm Jay McDaniels plays great I, defense. I don't understand why this kid. Well, not even a kid. This is a grown ass man. Why Rudy Gobert keeps getting the credit <laughs> for being this great fucking defender? And I've never, I've never seen his defense change an entire series. I've never seen it one time. I've never seen it. I want to flip this back to Aaron Gordon because you mentioned Cat. Right. His defense on Cat last night, I thought, made a big difference. Yes. So yes, I, there are people he who is can. The X I mean, and, and he always has been. Since they right? were winning, like he, if he play, if he goes, they go. He can't shoot. I think he last two games he shot sixteen for nineteen from the field. Like it just, yeah, you can't allow like, him to be that damn efficient. Like I mean, he, he's he was working, eleven for I get twelve it. last night, <laughs> right? And he was three for four last game. You know, I mean, he's he's yeah. he's put the work in, but again, he can't have that type of impact on the game and expect to win, especially when Yoke was doing his thing. Murray's getting hot. Like I mean, you just you have to shut one of those guys down. And for me, I think he might be the I'm not gonna say the easiest, but he will be the easiest out of those three guys. I mean. It is what it is. 
Well, I don't see something that happens before halftime have an impact on a playoff game that often. But there was an eight point swing in yeah. just the last few seconds of the of of the second quarter that I felt the Timberwolves did not recover from. And it will be interesting to see if that even carries over in terms of their mental state and and how they feel going into this game of just like every time they think they feel they've got Denver where they want them. You know, in these last couple of games, Jokic has led them to some sort of Houdini act, and then Murray chips in, and then Gordon chips in, and and, and that is what Michael Denver Porter did Junior to teams all. Yeah. Michael, right, that is what Denver did to teams all last postseason. Was you know, it's, they're a little deceptive sometimes, and then when crunch time comes, they just have so many ways to hurt you, and are so organized and so just coolly efficient, and and just nobody is they're just unflappable. Nobody's losing their temper. So I, I'm interested to see what happens there. I, I do want to keep an eye on Jamal Murray's calf to see where that ends up because I do think a little rest break helped him, and they're not going to have that the rest of the way. But but we will see. Basketball fans, we've seen it all this season, and the drama is only ramping up now that we're in the playoffs. The first round brought us some great moments and some historic individual performances, but that means there's only a few weeks left to get in on the DraftKings Pick 6 action. Right now, you can get in on the action with DraftKings Pick 6. It's a brand new way to play daily fantasy sports. I've teamed up with our partners at DraftKings to offer all new customers who play $5, they'll get $50 in Pick 6 credits. Getting started is simple. Just download the DraftKings Pick 6 app, sign up with the code BULLYBALL, pick at least two players, and choose if they're going to have more or less of a stat, like will they score more or less than 30 points or have more or less than eight assists. DraftKings has hooked it up so you can bet on almost any stat. Points, assists, rebounds, threes made, blocks, steals, combos, and so much more. There are truly just so many ways to win. Your two to six players can be on the same team in the same game or playing hundreds of miles apart. So start making your picks and compete against others for a shot at huge cash prizes. Now make sure you download the DraftKings Pick 6 app and sign up with our code BULLYBALL. Only on DraftKings Pick 6. The crown is yours. Have you ever wondered if Chet Holmgren might be a descendant of Abraham Lincoln? Or if a UFC fighter could beat an alien in a fight? Well, maybe you haven't, and that's okay. But Shea Serrano and Jason Concepcion from Six Trophies? Well, they certainly have. If you're like me and you like to listen to as many good basketball podcasts as you can... After you're done listening to Bully Ball, you got to listen to Six Trophies. Every week, Shay and Jason serve up the biggest moments from around the NBA with their patented mix of joy, banter, pop culture side quests. They also hand out six pop culture themed trophies for six basketball related activities. Stuff like the Denzel Washington in Training Day trophy that's given out to a player or team having the best week around the NBA or the Lauren Hill You might win some, but you just lost one trophy for the team or player that just can't get it together. Plus a bunch more trophies for all the good, bad, or just plain head scratching moments around the NBA. So follow Bully Ball, but also follow Six Trophies on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. Or you can listen ad free by joining Wondery Plus. We're going to move on to some other series here. Uh, I have a feeling the Rudy Gobert conversation is going to keep coming up, but we'll. there. Uh, Let's talk a little Knicks, Pacers. Um, We've been talking about the minutes that the Knicks have been playing for this entire playoff run, and it does seem to be catching up with them. The Pacers, obviously, the team to push them because the pace they play with, the depth they have. Um, Do you guys think that this is recoverable for New York? Because they do have a little, their own schedule quirk is interesting. They have to turn right around and play the next game, game five on Tuesday night. So it's still that every other pace, but it's at the garden and you do get this incredible energy left from playing an MSG and the role players play well and all of that stuff. And they might actually have to depend on a role player or two with the, with the minutes putting on these other guys. Um, they also Tibbs finally sat his guys down at the end of game four, where he was just like, great, this game is out of hand. So Josh Hart, who'd been playing 48 minutes a game, didn't have to do that. These guys got a little bit less mileage on their bodies at the end of game four. So you've got Nick's crowd. You've got a little, maybe a little more energy for game five. And then you have the extra day break in that series going into game six in Indiana. So it's just interesting. The schedule could help the Knicks a little here. Maybe, I don't know. Or do you guys feel like no OG Ananobi, it looks like again for game five. And, And Boog, at some point, you might not have the horses. 
Um, when it comes to a hamstring injury, one, usually that's a sign of fatigue. Two, mm-hmm. that's not an injury that's just easy to come back from. You can't rest yep. two, three days and just come back on a hamstring. A hamstring injury, a, a strain, a catch, those type of injuries take weeks. Like it's a it's a period of time where you just have to sit and do nothing. So I just and you know, hopefully he does come back. But even if he does, I just don't see him coming back being the same type of effective player that we you know, seen early on in the series. Um, yep. And we spoke on this earlier. When it comes to the Knicks and Tibbs and his his coaching style and the way he he goes about, you know, his teams, is history repeats itself. You know, we, we, we've we seen this time and time again where eventually his teams run out of gas. Um, and it's now coming to the point where he does have to depend on the bench. And I think it can get a little tricky because, you don't want to lose your your guys at the end of the bench throughout a playoff series, and that's easy to do once they feel like they're not, you know, ever going to play or are really a part of right. what's going on. So to expect, you know, anybody to kind of come in and just, you know, have this burst of energy, it's just not really realistic. Um, and Burks on top of that, I mean, Burks is a scorer. He's always been one, but mm-hmm. – is that going to change a series for the Knicks? Maybe, maybe not. But I'm, it's more so going to the style of, of coaching where it's relying on seven guys in the entire playoff series. It's just, it's just not a realistic thing. That's it's, that's it's just and a little it's not a, formula, it's not a formula of success in, in my five opinion. guys, <laughs> five guys. But it's been a little necessity. I'm going to defend Tibbs a little bit here in that. During the regular season, he actually did not do the wear these guys down thing. I have the number here. There's no Nick ranked in the top 10 in minutes a game during the regular season. So they had a bunch of injuries. You know, guys played a lot because of the injuries, but it wasn't the sort of typical what we criticize Tibbs for. I'm just going to play you no matter what and run guys into the ground on in individual minutes. However, in the playoffs, he has been running guys into the ground on in individual minutes, but it's because you don't have guys, right? No, I mean, Julius Randle, and it goes down the list from there, and I feel like guys drop like flies every day. Mitchell's gone. OG seems to be gone. I mean, there's just – there's so many guys where, where they don't have any more, so you got to play them the way they are. And Jalen Brunson is obviously hurt again. Here's another set of numbers for you, and, and I'm curious, Doe, like where, where this affects you just shooting-wise and, and all the stuff as a point guard – um, over the two games in Indiana, our friend Brian Windhorst had a great stat in the story he wrote of the game. He said uh, Brunson missed 10 of his jumpers short and that according to the tracking right. software they have, he was jumping two and a half inches lower on his shots than he did during the season. Uh, I thought that was a great stat in Brian's story. <laughs> what does that do to you, Udo? He's right on the head. I mean, that's fatigue. You know, he's a jump shooter maker, um, jump shot maker, and – uh, not having your legs, not having the proper rest, and being able to, or being, or having to make pretty much every play of possession, they're wearing his ass down, you know. And, and give kudos to to Rick Carlisle, he uh, he, he's doing a hell of a job. <laughs> how, uh, how, how hard was that though? Nah, I was gonna say, how hard was that to say? Not hard at all. I mean, call a spade a spade. You know what I mean? So, I think so. he's a really good coach. He makes hell of a adjustments. And again, like with him switching uh, Naismith on the Brunson. I mean, they're wearing him down. And like I said, he probably is, you know, I mean, he's, he's waking up thinking about Brunson and obviously trying to be the guy that slows him down and stops him. Everybody's seeing, you know, him being compared to Jordan and no Nick ever has done, you know, this and that. But uh, guys take pride in that, you know, seeing guys have those type mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, numbers pop up. And when you cry yourself on defense, I know a guy like myself, I took those challenges. You know, when Jeremy Lin came right. in going crazy, I wanted to be the guy to stop him. So it seems like Nate Smith took that challenge. Uh, and again, fatigue plays a factor. Um being a coach and adjustments make a factor. And this Pacers team, we've seen, they went down uh, to Milwaukee and responded. You know, they went down to Knicks and mm-hmm. responded. So, uh, like I said, they got a great job in the locker room. Uh, Miles Turner's playing well. I mean, they're playing well as a team. And I think last game, no one played over 25 minutes. So, they yeah. made to rotate so many guys here and there, understanding that Tib has played Josh Hart, you know, X amount of games, 10 straight games in 48 minutes. I mean, like you said, I could say history repeats itself and, it's just impossible to play. I mean, as much as a guy may say he wants to play and he looks good, eventually over time, uh, we're there in what game eight now, eight nine in the playoffs. So it's like it's catching up and it's showing. Like that stat that he had with numbers about Brunson jumping two inches shorter or whatever, two inches, whatever yeah. shorter. 
Um, that that's serious. You know, I was watching the game live, and every shot he took, the first like six or seven were short. Yep. Well, Neesmith too is just bigger, right? So, so putting him on him, and and I'm curious, guys. I mean, we see this over and over again. The strategy seems to be they can't call everything, right? They're not going to call every single time that he bumps him or plays him super physical, plays Brunson super physical going down the court. First of all, they're picking him up a foot from the baseline on the other side. I mean, it is it is a hundred percent wear him out, beat him up, make him work with for every step. Right. Once Dame got going, they did the same thing with Dame, picking up full, uh, full court, ninety four feet, mm-hmm. wearing him down. You know what I mean? Like it, it was. A, but they also like they also have a rotation of guys to do it. They're not depending right. on one Bingo. guy to do it. Bingo. Right. Smith is coming in. T.J. McConnell's coming in doing the Yeah, yeah man. Wait, 20 15 and 10, and 10 in 20 minutes. Oh, 15, 10. 15 and 10. 15 and 10 in 20 minutes. Like, in the playoffs. <laughs> that's the difference. Mm-hmm. That's the difference. Right. Jalen Brunson is not only having to score 40 a game just for them to have a chance at winning. He's having to bring the ball up every single possession against a guy guarding him full court. That's 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 impossible for anybody. That's anybody. So, And yet I hear everything you guys are saying. I see all the numbers you do. There's no extra bodies in the Knicks locker room that are going to pop out, right? Willis Reed's not coming. And yet, do you feel Indiana just has this series now? No. I know. <laughs> I, I still can't say that. No. I'm saying is I feel like Tibbs is making the job harder for them to find success by sticking to this same formula. I think that, there's nowhere know, at, th- at this point. What are they supposed to do? There's no one else, Boog. Who are they putting in there? Man, Alec Burks is a hell of a player. I think he helps. It shouldn't be to where he's playing because they're in a blowout. Like Alex Burks should be on the floor. Like I think he played some in the other games. I'd have to add. Uh, I, I just don't think they have enough. Still, but I just yeah. don't think they have enough, and we're seeing it's just, them wear them down. I mean, I know they're gonna have the energy when they go back to the garden. I get that, but the Pacers gonna have some energy as well. I mean. This is a knockout game. If they feel like they can get this one at, at the Garden, they know they're done when they come back to Indiana. So, I mean, that's, that's their. I'm sure that's their mindset, and that's what the, I'm sure the, the message that Rick is going to tell these guys: like, just win one game. If we win this game, uh-huh. they're done. Yep. They got. They got to try to win Game Five because, as I said, there's a, there's a little bit of a rest break before Game Six. Uh, so I just feel like if, if New York pulls off this gritty Garden goes crazy you know, bonkers game five and they win and they have momentum and then it's a closeout game. And then there's, you know, the opportunity to have some rest and then close the Pacers out in Indiana. I think New York has the potential to do that. That's why I don't feel like, oh man, this is Indiana's series now. There is a window here for New York to win still, even with the number of bodies they have. Um, I I just, the Pacers have, the the Pacers should win. They're so much healthier. They had 57 bench points in game four. And we know that role players don't play as well on the road, but they're just so much deeper at this point. And they should win the series with the way the personnel is right now, just strictly on that. Um, Isaiah Hartenstein, I think, hurt his shoulder in game four also. I mean, there's just every guy on the Knicks team is is banged up, but... (laughs) I still, I don't know. New York is so gritty and, and that building has been so electric. I, I don't know. So I can't say for sure on this series. I don't know if you guys have a gut feeling, but I can't say which I, way it's going to go right now. I do feel, I do feel with OG being, you know. Yeah, probably out. A questionable addition to the team right now. That slims New York's chance of, you know, winning this series. OG is a big part. Like if he's on the floor, I think they have a chance to pull it up. Without him, it's going to be really tough. You think uh, Demichizo can keep it up? No. He yeah, having 25. I mean, that's not sustainable. No, no. And he ran out of gas. You can see the magic start to He slip never averaged 25 in his life. And, I, and, that's, and that's my dog. He's never averaged yeah, 25 yeah. in his life. So did, no lie. Yeah, come on, bro. All right, let's talk about the Celtics, gentlemen. <laughs> Rashawn Rondo, you are up because the Celtics all year – They've been doing this all year. We've seen it, right? We knew this was going to happen coming into the playoffs. They either win by a lot because they can be so overwhelming or they sometimes look like they're getting bored. And I don't want to not give Cleveland credit because they're they're a game Cle- – Cleveland has a lot credit. of ingredients, right? <laughs> you got to give them credit. Give credit. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. You got to give them credit. This isn't just the Celtics couldn't yeah. be bothered. So Donovan Mitchell has shown again why he is a star. I, I just, I'm really interested to see what happens with him. Um, not just the summer, but over the course of the next few years. Um, I, I think that there's some 
good young players on that Cavs team and the interior and all the advantages they have, but the Celtics should handle this series pretty easily. Just if you look at the talent disparity here, even with Chris Stapp's Porzingis hurt, and sometimes they don't look like they're focused. I I don't know. What do you think that is, Rajan? Um, It's easy to get complacent and, you know, I'm going to say overlook your opponent, but at the same time, if you feel like you do have it on cruise control, um, being able to hit the button, turn it on and off, but at the same time, you're giving teams confidence. And when you do that, um, you know, you, you, you could be in a fight for a long time. Uh, give Cleveland yep. credit, though. You know, JB's done a hell of a job making his adjustments. Star player stepped up. Uh, role player stepped up for Cleveland in game two. So, um, you know, I, I'm not going to put it all on the Celtics of just them overlooking uh, or not respecting their opponent. They came out, you know, it's a mismake league. They, they shot poorly yep. from the three. And that's what they rely on. And look, so they redeemed themselves. In the they next did. Game, I mean, so. they did. They shot well. So, but like I said, it's a mismatch league. You know, they they did shoot yep. thirty five threes, and I think game two and lost. You know, I think eight for thirty five. But if they make six more threes, it might be a game. You know, so it's just it just depends. And defensively, they may be taking a step back in game two. But again, we saw what they how they responded on the road game three in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. So um, I didn't expect a sweep. Um, you know, even after game one loss, I didn't expect a sweep from Cleveland. Um, you know, those young guys are, are hungry. They want to fight. And with a leader in Donnie Bravo, uh, he showed up and stepped mm-hmm. out, showed out and stepped in game two. So uh, it might be 4 1, but at the end of the day, I still think Cleveland get another game. Uh, and if that happens, I don't think it, it's a knock to the Celtics. I mean, the year we won a championship, we played 26 games to win. And shit, we went seven with we went seven with Atlanta. I think seven with Cleveland. No, so. I was on so many airplanes <laughs> for you guys. I was yeah. like, really, you're gonna make us travel to this other city just so you can win there? Just win at home. <laughs> but we, yeah, we couldn't win on the road. Um, our first couple series. Um, but, but I remember. So like I said, we went seven both it. series, and we still were able to win it. So I, I think I see a lot of similarities in this team as well. I don't think you know people are expecting them to sweep for all, even though they just said they're going to, they're the favorites to come out of the East. I mean. Yeah. These guys did make the playoffs. They're well coached. Every team in the East, and um, you know you have to you have to earn it. That's what it's about. So you hear the reports out of Cleveland. JB's fighting for his job, so it'll be interesting to see if they do get another yeah. game here. You and always fight for your job as a coach. God damn, dude! It is it you is a rough extension. league right now. <laughs> I know it. Yeah, ask Frank Vogel about about the money he got paid. Right. I mean, it, it's I'm just sorry. and Darvin Ham, by the way. Like, I mean, it's just it's it's crazy. We'll get to the Suns coaching later, but I just <laughs> it is kind of unbelievable. I mean, Boogie, it, it's kind of crazy when you look at the Celtics that they have made the Eastern Conference Finals five of the last seven years. That's crazy, right? That's like the Detroit Pistons when they had their run making the Eastern Conference Finals over and over. Like, I. I just think we don't quite give that enough credit because we talk about the fact that they haven't broken through and won the title so often. And look, of those five out of seven years, only one time did they advance to the finals. When they did, they were up 2-1 and then just looks like they kind of let go of the rope. Golden State won a series that, frankly, the Celtics should have been in more. But mm-hmm. Jason Tatum right. said something interesting to me after game two. He said, I, I know, if, you know, he said some version of like, I know if we're not perfect, everyone gets on us. But is that kind of how it feels if you're the Celtics right now? That like you yeah. better win the finals, otherwise it's not good. Let me enough? let me speak to that know. real quick, right? Yeah, here. do it. Because I mean, it is what it is. Nobody remembers number two. Um, we don't hang conference binar- uh, banners, so it's like <laughs> it, that's part of it. Not in that you know, building. I'm not going to name any other organization, but at the same time, like I said, it is the Celtics organization, and they only hang yeah. title banners. That's part of it. It comes with it. He's been there for a while. He understands that. So it's no point of saying, you know, the things that you said, and you're entitled to have have the opinion you want to say. But at the same time, this is what it is as a C. Like, win or go home. Nobody remembers number two. He said it best. I have nothing to say. (laughs) (laughs) See, we we don't give a damn about conference finals. Like, fuck it. There you go. Rajan, yeah. I want to translate that for anybody watching right now is that Rajan is a, a very good guy and B won a title with the Lakers. So he is not going to say anything negative about that organization because he is a good person. And yet they hung a banner for a season mid season tournament. And I know exactly. Oh, they, what I was referring to. oh, they did. Oh, they did. Oh, they did. Oh, they did. I mean, it's the first oh, ever. I mean, it's, it's the first mm-hmm. ever. I mean, mm-hmm. You see that? And the See what he's doing bag. there. So, uh-huh. hey, see what he's doing there. He's but back he's to the Celtics. Tatum's back close. to the Celtics. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> this 
is what it is. You know, banner <laughs> 18. Yeah, it would be. We'll see. Yeah, that's the plan. That's all, that's <laughs> all you care about. Yeah. Let's talk a little Dallas guys because they have put their foot in on this series. And, and you know, look, we're going to talk about Kyrie. We're going to talk about Luca. Nothing runs without them. Uh, but PJ Washington, Daniel Gafford, Lively, they have elevated the Mavs on both ends. PJ Washington, by the way, I, I'm I'm sorry. I know if you're OKC, you're giving a lot of defensive attention to Luca and Kyrie, but you're leaving PJ Washington to do what he's doing. And book, how dangerous is that with the trio of these big men? When they made this trade at the deadline, I thought it was the perfect trade. I thought PJ Washington was perfect mixture of players to go with Kyrie and Luca. Um. Obviously, a Kentucky guy, so I'm a bit biased, but I also know what the kid can do. But it, this is no knock to um, Dallas. Uh, I think they're doing everything they're supposed to do. I think the, the the new additions are stepping up, playing their role, playing you know beyond expectations. Kudos to them. But for me, it's about OKC and their big man depth the big man experience and depth is it's just not there. And it's showing when it comes to Washington, Gafford and Lively, Lively, the, the youngest out of the group, but even he's, you know, producing at a high rate. He's playing great. He is. I just, I think that's a lot of pressure for the young kid. And, uh, okay. Uh, Chet, I think it's a lot of pressure for him to have to, you know, battle with these three guys on throughout this series. And, also for the young kid, Jalen Williams. Um, they don't have the experience. They the don't other have Jaylen the Williams, yeah. Yeah, the other Jalen Williams. They don't have the experience. They don't have the boat. Uh, the veteran presence isn't there. And it's not really, you know, a big on that bench that they can go to and get advice. Um, so I think it's starting to show. Um, Dallas Bigs are having their way. And I think that's also, you know, helping them, you know, control this series the way they are so far. Um, outside of Luke and Kyrie playing out of their minds, um, I think this is the difference in the series, just the, the big man activity. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chet has a lot of pressure on him. He's still learning. He's still young. I think he's going to have an incredible career. I think he's going to have a great career. But uh, to expect him to dominate these matchups with this really being his first year in the league, is just not realistic. So uh, I think that's the difference in this series so far. I mean, kudos to Washington. I mean, like I said, it's the perfect fit for him. Uh, he came mm-hmm. out of a toxic situation, and um, he's somewhere where he's appreciated, uh, along with Kyrie. You know, we've seen his happiness, the way he's been uh, very vocal in the press conferences. Um, we see him, you know, on, on social media laughing and shooting after practice. You know, just the energy and the chemistry that Jason Kidd has built in the organization. Um, shout out to Nico as well. Um, but they're just mm-hmm. you know, they're a happy family, you know, and obviously when, when you're winning, things are great. Everyone's smiling. But even through adversity in the first round with Dallas, you know, they've been able to stick with it um, and, and just give those guys credit. Like I said, it starts at the top with Jake Kidd. And I feel like they've given those young guys life and energy. Uh, and they've those young guys, their bigs in particular I'm talking about, has given them energy. And it's a different type mm-hmm. of coverage that they've having. To, um, okay, these bigs are having to change in this series versus last series uh, versus the Valentunas and – um, different type of bigs against the New Orleans Pelicans. Now they're facing Luka in pick and roll, Kyrie in pick and roll versus trying to keep a big, you know, from rotating behind them. Uh, all eyes are present on these two guys, these two dominant scoring guards, and they're losing sight of their man with offensive rebounds. Um, they're letting their roller get behind them. So it's just a lot of different coverages that they're not used to, accustomed to at this age, um, this lack of experience in, early on in this playoff. So I think that's what we're seeing. But, again, they'll go back home and make an adjustment and, and look forward to seeing what's going to happen next. Yeah, I mean, this series clearly not over by any long shot either, and there's a lot to play out here. But we do see the youth. We, we talked about it all going into this playoffs. Like, at some point, you pay for the fact that you haven't been there before. That's just the way the NBA works. Like, it's 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 a cliche because it's true. Like, like, guys with experience know what to do in those key moments. And size, we talked all season about the fact that the Thunder, as great as they have been play, as they were playing, and obviously number one seed, the fact that they got that at the end of the year was amazing. But they don't have the size some of these other teams in the Western Conference have. And Chet is tall, but he's not beefy, right? And and that matters when you're talking about the stuff you're talking about, Boog. And then I don't think you can have this conversation without talking about the way Kyrie Irving has elevated his defensive yeah. game. And, and we knew he had it in him. I, I covered him in Cleveland, and, and he played – Very sharp team defense in Cleveland. It's not like he doesn't know how to be a dog out on the court. But 
circumstances, obviously had a difficult few years, was not contributing on that end the way you would want him to in Boston, in Brooklyn. And then you look at what Jay Kidd has brought out of him in Dallas and the comfort level those two have with each other. I mean, do you know what it's like to be a guard who can defend that way? I, I want to give you another stat here. When defended by Kyrie Irving, opponents are shooting 11 percentage points worse than expected. That ranks fifth among <laughs> wow. any players real t- play, playing any real time in the playoffs here. 11 wow. percentage points worse than expected when defended by Kyrie. And one thing that you know, they mentioned last night in the press conferences or the other day in the press conferences was that he's so handsy, right? And those great hands that we see with the finishes around the rim, the steals that he's getting, he's averaging nearly four deflections a game, though that the impact is is so huge. It's almost even hard to quantify, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's one of the greatest players we've ever seen play the game. I mean, we all be in all of his offensive skill set. But again, if he wants to click a button and play defense, which we've seen that he's doing. Um, you know, he's taking pride in his defense. Obviously, him and Luka as, as different uh, as deficiency on the guard level on the, on the defensive side. What they say, so they say. But they both taking pride. Um, like I said, Luka in last series against the Clippers and this series and, and Kyrie in this entire playoffs. But again, we're giving a challenge to guy of his magnitude. How great he is! He's accepting it and, ex- and excelling in his role. I, I I don't think we're using the correct term on, on what we're, you know, why we're speaking on Kyrie. I think. Mm-hmm. I think the main thing that Kyrie has shown throughout this playoff is leadership and championship yep. leadership. Um, yep. You know, that's not really a term that's attached to Kyrie's name because there's so much dirt. It should be, though. Name. And it should be. This is championship leadership. He's showing it on both sides of the ball. He's doing it through his play. It's not necessarily vocal. Um, and he's also – doing it within his role. He's allowing Luka to be Luka, and then at the same time, he's being Kyrie on both ends of the ball. So um, I just want to, you know, give him his flowers for showing the leadership because, you know, they're so quick to throw dirt on his kid's name. Um, I'm happy for him to be in this happy place. We see him smiling. We see him, you know, relaxed. We get to see the Kyrie that we were used to seeing. And um, it's almost like, you know, being in a relationship. If if you want the best in your relationship, you got to cater to your girl. And I think the yeah. Dallas Mavericks are catering to Kyrie and making sure he's happy and in a good place. And, and, and with that being said, the same return for them, right? Exactly. Yep. If you if you want if right. you want the best out of your girl, you, you got to give her the best. And I'm telling you, there you go. It's yeah. it's a happy year. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, the respect between him and Jay Kidd. You know, he went to Jason Kidd's Hall of Fame induction just because he was such a big Jason Kidd fan, right? They had a relationship. It's not like they never had a relationship, but he had never played for him at that point. It, it was an unexpected sighting at J. Kidd's Hall of Fame induction. It was just sort of like, oh, Kyrie's here? And, and it was just because of the amount of respect and love that he had for J. Kidd. So I, I just think that tells you what's going on there. And Jason, from the day Kyrie walked in there, has had that kind of respect for Kyrie, which, as you point out, not everyone around the league has had. And so yeah. the fact that they he knew what it would take to get the best out of him and vice versa, I, I think has been exceptional. And when you are knocking down an opponent's shooting percentage by more than ten percent, that is That's wild, yeah. That's impressive. <laughs> that is that is gonna make a difference. So no, I was saying he showed up to my fiance's fashion uh, fashion show. Kyrie did. Like I said, and we don't have a great relationship, so that's just kind of what you said. <laughs> He's a great human being. <laughs> One of my favorite players to watch. I encourage Pierre to watch him all the time. Like, watch him. Really? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, Jason, I think, by the way, is the other factor we haven't talked about as much when I'm talking about this series. Jason is a guy who has been through all the wars. He's done everything from the spill coke to everything he did <laughs> as a player, <laughs> like all the stuff, everything in Dallas and Dirk, all the, all the years. It sure. makes a difference when you're in these moments. And, you know, obviously Mac- Mark Dagno is coach of the year and, and has done an incredible job there. But it, it makes a difference when you have coaches that have been through a lot. And Michael Malone, we talked about it earlier in this show, he made some great adjustments going into this weekend in Minnesota. And Michael Malone has been very vocal about the fact that there were at least two inflection points where management in Denver ownership could have fired him. 
and they stuck with him and they knew that he was a good coach who maybe had a down year or who had bad injuries or had other things going on and they stuck with him and it makes a difference. And here we see again, you. <laughs> another franchise rotating the door. Well, I'm sorry. It feels dumb to have to say that, that, that like smart coaching and consistency make a difference, but it doesn't seem to be the standard in this league. I just told you that all of the reporting out of Cleveland is that JB is fighting for his job there. And we had the Suns just hire Mike Budenholzer. And I wanted to get your guys' take on it, um, especially you, Boogie. You played for him in Milwaukee, oh. a five-year, fi- five-year, $50 million plus deal. And replacing Frank Vogel, they won titles, I think, back to back. Frank won in 20 and and Bud won in 21. And it's just, okay, here's the revolving door. What do you think on on this hire and and Bud getting that job, Bug? Uh, Well, my first thought on this is it's it's mighty ironic how players are held to to these standards when it comes to, you know, character flaws and – you know, what type of person they are on and off the court. And, you know, those things are held against them. Mm-hmm. <sighs> I'm not well, quite you start there. You might as well just say it. No, I don't have to say anything. I, I'd rather people read between the lines. <laughs> but um, also, <laughs> when it comes to um, the signs, I feel like they're putting a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. No peroxide. They ain't even clean the fucking wound. It's no peroxide, no neosporin, <laughs> no rubbing alcohol. They just slap the uh, band-aid on there and say it get better. Can't um, wait to next year. <laughs> this this doesn't really move the needle. And, and and at the same time, we're we're still in this this era of where we're just recycling the same coaches. Like <sighs> Frank Vogel won the championship in twenty twenty. Right. Bud won a championship 2021. What's the fucking difference? Like, I don't understand, like, how this fix, fixes your problems as a franchise, as a team. Or, I mean, that's the problem. To me, you can't, you can't particularly blame the coaches. If, you, if you're the hire and you bring in a coach, a championship caliber coach, and then you fire him a year later, like, what sense does that make? I feel like that's a player fire. Um, um, but but my, what I'm confused about is, like, before you hire this guy, you don't talk to the players. I don't, I don't, I don't get why you would try to give, make him the scapegoat when it's like you look at the, pro, the production of the players on the court. Like at some, they have to be held accountable at some point. You can't hire a coach when you expect him to win a championship. And on top of that, seeing what the team that they got swept by is doing to the defending champs right now. So it's like I thought they would give him a little bit more grace as far as like, okay, cool. It's not just a mm-hmm. fluke. Like this team is legit. Like. They would have lost yeah. – Phoenix would have lost them bitches in, in the conference finals. Like, regardless, they would have lost them regardless. Right. Because they have dogs on right. the perimeter that want that smoke. Yeah. And they don't have – like, I don't I don't get why – I'm upset. I, I disagree with that. I'm, I'm upset. I don't have any problem with Mike. It's not about him. It's about, like I said, the organization and how they just fired Frank, and now they're expecting Mike to come and do something different if they don't change their roster. Like, right. there has to be a roster change. <laughs> The roster that's, and sucks. that's in general manager. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the hell, the, the best player off the bench. And my, it's my dog. It's Eric Gordon come off the bench. Like you can't expect him to give you twenty five or, you know, he's not the six six man candidate player of the year anymore. Like he's not the same caliber player. He's old, a lot older now. So it's like that's what you're offering. That's what you're, the tools you're giving me to play with. You know, what I mean, to go out here and and, and win. Book, do you see, I mean, you know, as I said, you were up close in that locker room with Bud and his coaching style, even if just talking X's and O's, like, do you see him being able to do anything differently or what, what do you, do you see him unlocking something we don't see? I mean, I assume they're going to get a point guard. I assume they're going to get healthier. I don't think it's about his coaching style. I think it's more so about his personality and, and, and the personalities he wants to mesh with. When it comes to coaching, it's not just about X's and O's. It's about managing egos. It's about managing different personalities. And as a coach, you can't you can't uh, shortcut it by saying, oh, well, I just don't like this personality, so I don't want to coach. Like, well, that's right. a disaster waiting to happen. Um, yep. And that's part of the reason – P.J. Tucker didn't go back to Milwaukee after winning the championship because he didn't like P.J., which is fucking mind-blowing. So, um, Everyone likes P.J. Uh, right. So my thing is, it's like, it's, <laughs> like I said, I just don't understand this recycling door. It, you know, coach goes here, and then he's there for two years, then he's 
over to another team for another two years. And what happened to teams creating chemistry? Uh, the reason that, that Denver is as good as they are, they've been together right. for right. years. The same coach, the same core, years. They went through losses. They went through wins. They've been through ups and downs together. That's how you figure out yourself as a team. This recycling door of coaches for, you know, two years here, a year here, you'll never find success that way. Trying to trying to find a coach that's going to win a championship in one year, that's a hard thing to do for I any – I don't care who was on your with, even, But with the roster they had, though, like it's not even – like you got guys that don't Impossible. take pride in defense. Like it, it just no doesn't No accountability sense, like, from anybody, bro. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what are we doing? James Jones, is, is, he, he gets to hide in the shadows after putting together this bullshit-ass roster. Like, he's not resp- – it's Frank Vogel's fault. But James Jones puts this bullshit-ass roster together with no point guard. But I don't think it's James Jones' fault either. I really don't. I, I don't think it's either one of their fault. I think you had a new owner who came in who – as every new – I mean, again, I said this hey, before. Managed to be a well. out to be I've a great owner well. in this league, but they do it every time. It's like it's like clockwork. It's like so I have a new one owner game, who's – is he not fired? If they win one game, they lose 4-1. Is he, you know what I mean? Like we- <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. But you have a new owner who came in. He knew better than everybody, just like they always do. It's it's, it's textbook. Makes a huge trade for KD. Makes the other trade for Badly Beal. I don't think that's James Jones' fault. That was a directive from above. And then I have to assume this was too. And, and again, the quick trigger. And, and the organizations that behave this way are, are actually causing – the, t- the coaches who do play for the right organization, the guys like the Nuggets coach, you know, obviously Dallas, they're being patient, all that stuff. Jay Kidd just got a contract extension that he can directly, I hope he sends a thank you note to LeBron James because it is the threat of the Lakers wanting to take him away that got him that coaching extension in Dallas. And by the way, obviously, because he deserved it, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but the yeah, timing like, so of it was yeah, very yeah. specific, yeah. right? And... <laughs> Ty Lue is going to get the same extension, by the way, and he deserves it also, and he was due for one, but I'm sorry. You can thank the Lakers for the size of the number that is going to come across there. Right. Right? I agree. Time is all about – that's life. It's all about time. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) So, Doe, I have been wondering what Boogie is doing with his ass over in Taiwan. I mean, I see the scores – I get, I get what he's doing on the court. I know, I know the impact you're having, but I would like to know what is going on in the shadows because you out, plop man. this man down in Asia for going on a month, and I want to know. So, fortunately, my prayers have been answered. I would like to present to you all the Chronicles of Boogie. Yes, this man has had someone following him around with a camera in Taiwan, and we get to see a short first installment. Please, okay. producer Eric, will you roll for us the Chronicles of Boogie in Taiwan? This is my youngest kid's first time, you know, flying international, flying for an extended amount of time. So uh, that was an experience and an adventure in itself. You know, I'm excited for them to, you know, get this experience and, you know, see different parts of the world. And it's even more cool because it's happening for them at such a young age. So, you know, I think that's just cool with, you know, their growth and their exposure to the world. And I'm excited, you know, for them to experience this. But my kids love animals and went to a really, really cool zoo here in um, Taipei. Y'all at school right now? Oh, that's so cool. You get to go to the zoo. Y'all gotta make sure you thank your teacher. He wants to ask you if you're the Michael's cousin. Yes. No, really. No, seriously. You wanna see my ID? His arm's longer, man. Okay, I'm gonna heat up and grew up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I I love doing things like that with the family and you know, we had a blast. Oh man, each fan. Yeah, we're from Birmingham. It's oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Hey, that's my old stomping ground, man. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's great. For real? Yeah. yeah. That is crazy. What's up? How you doing? <laughs> Bro, I, nah, that was crazy. Like, and it's crazy because it shows how small this world really is, but 
The fact that I would run into a Birmingham native in Taiwan is, man, it's just crazy what this game of basketball does. It takes you all over the world. You, you, you meet new people and you meet old people. So um, I thought that was really cool. The shout out to the rappers, man. Taiwan is basically like a quarter of Pennsylvania. We have our bullet train system, and then you can basically take the bullet train from north of uh, Taiwan to south, south of Taiwan for an hour and a half. Man, we, we finally realized we were really in a foreign place, and we spent about an hour and a half just walking around trying to figure out directions. We didn't have Wi-Fi, obviously, throughout the city. Once you kind of get outside the hotel, your phone gets a little wacky. So you can't pull up the directions, and when things are in, in their languages, it, it's just hard to translate the different things that's going on. So um, we realized that in the midst of, you know, going on a hunt for dinner, which initially was supposed to be two to three minutes down the street, <laughs> exchanging fan interaction and pictures for, for information on different places. It was a unique situation, but uh, we made the best of it. And, uh, you know, just searching for dinner after travel and practice, and eventually ended our night with a 7-Eleven dinner. <laughs> uh, Doritos and lemon tea was, was the entree for the night. The meal of champions, source of power. Family <laughs> lamb for dinner, man. How'd you feel about the earthquake, bro? Shit was spooky. They all spooky. Yeah, I was scared. I don't have a problem saying that. Definitely didn't rock me to sleep. My problem is this with these earthquakes, bro. Why are these bitches only happening at night and they're literally happen happening at like the same time? Nah, when you in your deepest sleep. Like, <laughs> then it's like, no, wake up, niggas. <laughs> Wake up! We've been here, what, two weeks? It's been about 35 earthquakes, 35, 40 earthquakes. So um, it's, it's it's a bit traumatizing being woken up in the middle of the night, you know, to a 6.1 earthquake, <laughs> you know what I mean? So the room shaking, the walls shaking, everything rattling. <laughs> like, my heart started racing. I'm just like, what the fuck? You know, I wish everybody safety. Um, praying for everyone to, you know, be able to make it home to their families and, you know, stay out of harm's way. So, uh, yeah. Signing up. <laughs> uh, 40 earthquakes. Is, I knew it was earthquaking a lot over there, but that's... <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's going up. That's out of control. Bro. It's going up. <laughs> what does that feel wow. like? I mean, that's got to feel just like at any moment, the earth is moving. I'm, you know what? I'm waiting on the episode of us filming when one of these bitches pop off. Like, yeah, <laughs> I've been waiting. It hasn't well, happened yet. Be filming at four in the morning. Damn, that's crazy. That was one day, though. That's, dude. Mm. Oh, dude, it was, I'm how, glad how, you're how kids. with that. Yeah, how the kids are calm. They've only they've only realized it one time. And it was okay. Okay. it was another one like three days ago and they started laughing at it. They thought it was like a, a fucking yeah, crowd or some shit. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah, other ones they had two fans you know. that was waiting on you though when you got there. Yeah. Shout out to them two fans. <laughs> oh man. Oh god. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say the zoo, because the zoo the people at the zoo. <laughs> no, that's about it when you get off the airplane. <laughs> This is mean. This is mean. Oh my God. <laughs> hey. You in Taipei, Taiwan? Yeah. Okay, that's why I did I did some deal with Red Bull out there with basketball. Yeah. There were no when I was there, though, but yeah, that was crazy. I've been here before, but too. The fans one are great play. there. Oh, the fans crap. are great. I love that they, they know you on the street. Yeah. <laughs> that's just dope being dope, man. Yeah, that's dope being dope, man. This is what I show up. Hey, listen, I need y'all to show up at the airport. <laughs> Make Cubs feel good for coming in. Man. Oh, man. <laughs> Look, when you come back to Las Vegas, you're going to see two fans, Doe and I. Joe and I are going to be there with signs. Hey, man. When you, you better come back, be we're going to be like, Boogie, I'm, I'm sorry, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
my that's going to be us that's when you come back. No, no, no. Oh. I'm just saying we're going to be there at the airport with him. But we got to uh, we got to shout out the fact that you are made the finals, right? Yeah, we just made the that's finals. That's not in the piece. Oh, work. But Congrats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. both yeah. teams in the finals. You've been so. over for four days. <laughs> you in the finals? <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> Y'all got three teams? Five. <laughs> <laughs> I was close. <laughs> man, finals oh. is the finals. Make it or you don't. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> oh. So congratulations. I'm excited. I know you'll be over there now for a few more weeks because of this. So uh, I'm excited to see more Chronicles of Boogie. I love watching all that. I like the pandas. I'm oh, all sure. in on the panda. That was my favorite part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and don't I'll coordinate on the airport on your way back. What was the regular season? <laughs> <laughs> can catch all episodes of Bully Ball on the DraftKings Network all the Smoke Productions YouTube channel please rate and review us wherever you get your podcast we need those five star reviews and um, maybe by the time you see us next week there will be another team in the league over in Taiwan we don't know maybe they will maybe they won't he should be it's just win one game it ain't no serious is it? oh man <laughs> talk it's about rough. a tip though <laughs> Hey man, let's rough. get off of this shit, man. <laughs> I'm done. Hey, I mean, that's you averaging cuts. <laughs> <laughs> He's putting up Josh uh-huh. numbers. We will catch you next week. We're out. <laughs> Peace, man. Uh-huh. <laughs>